Amen. Well, good morning, church. How we doing? We good? Well, you welcome everybody watching online with us right now, wherever they might be. We are so glad that you're here, and we hope that you've taken note that next week we're having church. It's just not going to be necessarily in this building, and that's okay, that we are going to worship God wherever we are. We realize this July 4th, and we have tons of volunteers that are going to be traveling, and we even have people trying to figure out how they could go to the beach or do their things and somehow serve, and we didn't want to put them in that predicament, so we just wanted to say, hey, we want to give you permission to just rest and just take a weekend. We have volunteers every Sunday that get here between like 4.30 and 5 o'clock and are here all day just serving, and that's a.m. Some of y'all didn't. That comes twice a day. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. And so we just want to honor them. We were originally going to call this Vintage at Home, and then we realized the reason why we're doing this is because ain't nobody going to be at home. So we are literally calling this Vintage Wherever, and we hope that wherever you are next weekend at this time, you're not even under a roof. You're under a beautiful blue sky with your toes in the sand, and we will not be jealous if we're stuck somewhere that isn't like that. Amen. We will celebrate that. So um, we will continue to be in this series. It'll be the next installment of this fruitful series where we're walking through Galatians chapter five, leaning into the fruits of the spirit. So if you want to go ahead and grab your Bible, pull up the vintage app, however you're going to access God's word and let's get ready to dive in. Last night I did a wedding. And it's interesting. I love doing weddings. Shout out to Storm and Kaylin, our video director. They got married last night. We celebrate them. But this happened from time to time. I go to do a wedding and people say, are you the preacher? Yes, ma'am. Well, you don't look like a preacher. Thank you. I will take that as a compliment. It's funny, like we have in our mind the way certain things are supposed to look and be, right? Whether it be preachers and that kind of stuff. And I don't know about you, but in our culture, we have this, even this idea of what a Christian is supposed to look like or dress like or sound like. And what I've discovered is we all don't look the same. Come on. That there is some variation in who we are as people in really beautiful ways. And we all don't walk the same path, but we all follow the same person. We don't all have the same story. We don't all have the same journey. We're not all walking the same path. Some of ours is longer and a little bit more crooked. It got a few more rocks in it than we'd like. Come on, somebody. But we're all following the same person. And we don't all walk the same path. But we, if we're following the same person, should produce the same fruit. And that's at the heart of what Paul's trying to get at. In Galatians chapter 5, we walk through this, this book, this letter that Paul wrote to the church in Galatia, and, and he's helping us understand the gospel. And in chapter 5, he says, well, like, when, you, when you understand the gospel and when you follow Jesus, there is fruit that is produced in your life. That as we follow Jesus, fruit flows from our lives, and it's the kind of fruit that you want. It's the fruit that nobody's allergic to. It's the good fruit. It's the best fruit. That a life in full pursuit of Jesus and full surrender to his spirit, that it will produce, I don't care where you're from, what country you grew up in, that if you claim Jesus, these are the things that we have in common. Galatians chapter five, verse 22 says, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And against such things, there's no law. Now, those who belong to Christ, Jesus crucified the flesh because the flesh never leads us where we really want to go with its passions and desires. Verse 25, but if we live by the Spirit, let's follow the Spirit as well. And have you ever noticed that that's the invitation that Jesus constantly extended to people? follow me. Do you remember? Every time he would go up to this ragtag, ragamuffin group of young men that became those disciples, he would walk up and the invitation was, follow me. So let's follow the spirit as well. And let's not become boastful as we grow in our faith and our understanding of him and we mature. Don't don't become boastful or challenging one another or envying one another. That a life in love with Jesus and in surrender to his spirit, and as we follow him, that there is fruit that flows from our lives. And when we got here, we had not planned to stay here, and no one even planned to do this series, but felt like we needed to lean into these fruits, because we need to make sure we understand what these things are. And if there's one thing I've learned, I'm not going to assume anymore that we all understand and are on the same page about what these fruits really mean. 
that what is love? What is joy? What is peace? What is patience? What is it in their pure, powerful sense? And how are they different from somebody who may seem to have these qualities that doesn't know Jesus because it's different? And the problem is too often we read these things and we misdefine them. And when you misdefine it, you misunderstand it. And when you misunderstand it, you misapply it. Or maybe this is, but when you misdefine it, you misunderstand it, and far too often you misrepresent it. And so we decided, all right, let's just stay here for a minute, and let's lean into these, every single one of them, all of them, not just like a cherry picking a few, but we're walking through all the fruits of the Spirit. Notice I said cherry pick fruit. That's kind of cute. And all the fruits, sorry, all the fruits of the Spirit. And I know every week I say, guys, this is the one. This is the one that we most can't afford to misunderstand. And I'm going to say it again this week. I'll probably say it again next week. But the one we're unpacking this week is the fruit of faithfulness. And I know that I've said it every week that, y'all, of all the fruits of the Spirit that we cannot afford to misdefine, misunderstand, misrepresent, like this, this is the one. But this one is of utmost importance, not because I think so, but because Scripture says so. Do you remember Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6? And without faith, it is impossible to please God. So all the other times I've said it, maybe you can dismiss it. Here, we cannot, because Scripture affirms what I just said. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. So of all the fruits of the Spirit, do we have to be sure that we understand that we are allowing His Spirit to produce in our lives, to be faithful? It's faithfulness. I almost want to separate faithfulness, that a life following Jesus produces the fruit of faithfulness. And this is not just a thought that's captured by the writer of Hebrews. When you walk through the Gospels and you see Jesus's ministry and the interactions that he has with people, you see very quickly the high value that Jesus placed on faith. Jesus lived in a culture where knowledge was everything. Even to the folks that considered themselves to be religious. It was a place of great knowledge. And the religious people in his day saw their value in their level of knowledge. The more they knew, the more they respected. And they believed the more they knew, the closer they got to God. It was almost an agnostic type mindset. But you know, Jesus was never impressed with the level of their knowledge. He was always moved by the depth of their faith. That it was not the level of their knowledge that made Jesus stand up and take notice. What they knew did not cause him to take notice. It was their faith. And nothing frustrated Jesus more than little faith, and nothing moved his heart greater than great faith. Go with me, Matthew chapter 13. Let me show you. Matthew chapter 13. Y'all remember this? It says, coming to his hometown, he, Jesus, coming to his hometown, he began teaching the people in their synagogue, and they were amazed because knowledge impressed them. They thought, this dude knows some things. Where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers, they asked? Isn't this, ain't that Joseph's boy? That's how they said it if they was from Randleman. Amen. Come on, somebody. (laughs) Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't this, isn't his mother, isn't her name Mary? Aren't his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? Aren't all his sisters still like living in here? Where did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is without honor except in his own town and in his own home. And verse 58, and he did not do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. That nothing frustrated Jesus more than a lack of faith. And here he finds himself in his hometown and they can't get past what they know. 
Because remember, Jesus, when, when God brought Jesus on the scene for 30 years, he hid him away in obscurity. And at this point, Jesus is just moving into his ministry that would only be about a three-year span. So what they know about Jesus in this moment versus all the history they know about him, they have a really hard time believing. They're like, that's, that's Joseph's boy. That's, his sister lives in my neighborhood. I remember him. And it says, because of their lack of faith. And now sometimes preachers have kind of misrepresented this passage. It wasn't that Jesus couldn't do very many miracles because God is not limited to or by us. It says he chose not to. It says he didn't do it because of their lack of faith. Because see, sometimes we read that verse and think, well, okay, if I have enough faith, then God will do anything. Look at me. No amount of faith will ever move God to do something that you want that isn't in alignment with his will. That's good. No amount of faith will ever move God to do what you want that isn't also in alignment with his will. But see, that comes down to this thing of misunderstanding faith. Well, if I just have enough faith, then God will do it. God will never do anything that's contrary to his will, his nature, his character, his greater good for his glory in this world. Come on. He won't. And what was happening here is not that he couldn't do anything. It's just because of their lack of faith, he didn't. That distinction is really important. Did I, did I make it clear enough? Come on. It's really important. But then as much as a lack of faith frustrated Jesus, the presence of great faith always moved to his heart. And when he saw it up close, he always brought it to people's attention. Go to Matthew chapter eight. Matthew chapter eight, verse five. It says, when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed and he's suffering terribly. And Jesus said, shall I come and heal him? The centurion replied, Lord, I don't deserve to have you even come under my roof. But just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes. And that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. And when Jesus heard this, he was amazed and he turned to those following him. And he said, truly, I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. That every time Jesus bumped up against a person with great knowledge, it didn't impress him. He constantly was engaging with these Pharisees, these people that, that could quote the scriptures and the law and knew the prophets and had all this knowledge. But then he walks up to a guy who's a centurion, a soldier, a military man. And he recognizes authority when he sees it. And he, Jesus, will you heal my servant? Yeah, you want me to come to your house? Nope. I'm not even worthy of you coming to my house. But I know if you just speak from here to there, it can move. It can do something powerful. So I, be, I, I so believe in you. That I know, I am confident in, that if you say it, he will be healed. And that's faith. And that moved his heart. And he took notice. And this is a concept that we see all throughout Scripture. That it doesn't say anywhere that we are driven by knowledge. That knowledge is the gateway to great things. No, it says faith faith. Go to Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. Do you remember this? We already read it. We read it in the plain and simple series where Paul is describing this new life he has in Christ. He says in verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That I had a life that was driven by knowledge. I had a life that was controlled by the pursuit of knowing and knowing and knowing and knowing. But what I realize now is knowing can only take you so far. There is, there is eventually a time when knowledge hits a wall. Come on, somebody. 
There is a time when knowledge hits a wall, when there is an end to intellect, when there is a threshold to your understanding, and faith is what closes the gap between that point and you walking forward in faith with God. And see, I know we live in this place, and there's a lot of people sitting in this room, Matt, when I, when I get all the answers, when I have all the questions figured out, when I cross all the T's and dot all the dies, then I believe in Jesus. You know, my answer is you never will, because that's what makes him God. There's a gap between what your little brain can figure out. And I'm not, look at, I'm not saying there's not a place for knowledge. Knowledge can be a great pathway to faith. But knowledge in and of itself is not enough and has a limit. Are you with me? Say amen. It has a limit. And what's, what faith is, is when you bump up against that spot, when you hit that threshold, Faith has to be engaged to move you forward. Romans chapter one, verse 17, for the gospel, for in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by, say it again, faith from first to last, just as is, is as written, the righteous will live by faith. That all throughout the New Testament, we see this powerful theme that faith is the fuel that moves the follower forward. And without it, we cannot please God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, we live by faith and not by sight. Because there's going to come a moment when what you see does not align with what he has said and what you do next will determine whether or not you have faith or you don't. So what is faith? And see, here's the problem. All of us know all this, and we think, yeah, I have faith. I know what faith is. But one of the biggest mistakes that we've made in Christian culture is somehow made belief and faith synonymous with one another. And I would submit to you, they are not, and that is dangerous. We have somehow put faith and belief as kind of like interchangeable words, they oh, faith and belief, same thing. No, they're not. No, now, don't get me wrong. Belief is a good gateway to faith. Belief leads to faith. But until belief transforms into something more, it's nothing. So that begs, okay, well, what is faith? Well, the writer of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. See, faith is so much more than just belief. Faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Do you, do you see, even in those few words, in that singular sentence, God is trying to communicate to us that there's something more to faith than just belief. That belief is not enough. Knowledge is not enough. That if some form, at some point it doesn't transform into more, then nothing changes. See, God has not called you to just believe in something. He's called you to trust in someone. And when you understand that reality is when things begin to shift in your lives. It's just like, and you've heard this really simple illustration of you can believe that that chair was created for you to sit in it. You can believe that it will hold you up when you place your backside in it. But belief transformed to faith when you sit down. Belief transforms into faith when you sit down. See, faith is when belief and behavior finally intersect. When they finally line up, belief becomes faith when what you know, what you say you believe actually begins to practically play out in the way that you live your life. That's faith. That you can walk around believing a whole lot of stuff, but if that belief never moves into your heart and transforms the way that you operate, it is simply belief and not faith. And there, belief is not a fruit of the Spirit. 
It is not love, joy, peace, peace, kindness, and belief. It's faithfulness. And until you make that transition from simply believing to letting belief dictate behavior in every way, only then do we transform into faith. You're not convinced? Go to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. And let me just kind of set the stage for where we are. This is going to be one of the last few things that Jesus says after preaching the Sermon on the Mount. Best sermon ever preached. Why? Because Jesus preached it. And remember this sermon, it starts way back in Matthew chapter 5, and he opens up with these Beatitudes, and then Jesus just hits the gamut. He's an equal opportunity offender. He talks about lust and divorce and all these different things. And then right before he dismisses the congregation, he says in verse 24, therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. He didn't say, man, y'all are so good now that you heard it. He says, anybody that hears and puts it into practice is wise. And so many of us, we settle for hearing and falling short of doing, and we call ourselves faithful. When y'all get quiet, I know I'm hitting it on the target. He says, not the one who hears it isn't wise. The one who's willing to carve out time to sit in a sanctuary on Sunday is not the one who's wise. It's the one who takes what they've heard and actually puts it into practice. That's wisdom in the eyes of God. He says, you can hear it. You You can know it and not do it. You can listen to it and not live it. And that is not what faith is. Verse 25, see, the rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundations on the rock. But, verse 26, but anyone who hears the words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose. Y'all remember that song in Kids Church growing up? I will not sing it. The rain came down. And the streams rose. Some of y'all are like, yeah, I remember that. What am I reading? Uh, The rain came down, and the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Jesus said, the wise people aren't the people who show up just to hear or sit down just to read. The wise one is the one who realizes that those private disciplines must lead to practical application or they're pointless. Like it's awesome to have those private disciplines of sitting down with your cup of coffee and your worship music playing and reading the word of God at your kitchen table every morning at 5.30 a.m. That's awesome. But if those private disciplines don't translate to practical application, then Jesus himself just said, that's foolish. And we know this. Listen, you can know how to exercise and never be healthy. You can know how to eat right and still not lose them LBs. Right? Knowing anything is never changed a thing. Only when that knowledge is put to use does something really significant happen. It's true about every area of life. Just like you can know how to exercise and be unhealthy, you can know scripture and be spiritually immature. Because it's the ones who practice this. And nobody said this more profoundly, more bluntly than Jesus' baby brother James. One of my favorite books in the Bible, whenever somebody says, hey, I'm new to faith, what do I read? Gospel of John, book of James, start there, and we'll move on. James, this baby brother of Jesus, who knew what it was like to have a lot of knowledge of Jesus and not really faith in Jesus, because he spent most of his life in that space, he got tired of hearing Mary saying, let me tell you how your baby brother was born, it was so special. See, an angel came, and then we rode a donkey, and all these things, and he did cry at the manger, I don't care what the song says, I was there. 
James, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed and does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, it's dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I'll show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God? Good, even the demons do that. That if belief was the threshold of necessary, then the devil and the demons would be all right. And they're not, in case you didn't know. He says, no, there has to be this transition where faith is not just, faith is not just a belief we hold in our minds. It is a truth that we apply to our lives. At some point, it, belief and behavior intersect, and that is when faith occurs. And so often we're bumping up against the threshold of our knowledge and our understanding and all these things. And what's necessary to go the distance in obedience to God is faith producing us by the spirit, listening to his voice, trusting in what he says is true. Faith is only faith is measured when trust is demonstrated. And only then. It's not just knowledge about it's trust in that's faith. That's faith. That's the faithfulness produced by the Spirit in the life of a follower of Jesus. And one of my favorite stories of this faith in action is that moment. Do you remember this? It's in Matthew chapter 14, where Jesus sends his disciples out on the water to go ahead to their next location where they want to do ministry while he hangs out and spends some time with the Father. And in the middle of the night, Jesus decides he wants to join them, and he doesn't jump in a kayak. He just starts walking across the water. And now these disciples see this ghostly figure walking on the water, and Peter and his bad self, he looks up and says, I think that's Jesus, but I'm not really sure. And remember, Peter, Peter was a fisherman before he decided to follow Jesus, which means his father would have been a fisherman and probably his grandfather. Peter grew up on the water. And when people stepped out in the water, they usually went under. But there's this moment, Matthew 14, 28, Lord, if that's you, tell me to come to you on the water. And verse 29, come. If it's me, I'm like, no, nah, I believe you, man. I'm going to stay right here. <laughs> I recognize your voice, Jesus. <laughs> because this storming and the waters and, and like Peter, Peter's, I've never walked on water before. But in faith, when you join Jesus where he is, you can do things you couldn't do otherwise. And y'all know the story. Peter throws his leg over the bow of the boat and he starts walking to Jesus. And it says, but when he saw verse 30, but when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and called him, you of little faith, why did you doubt? He says, Peter, did you really think I was going to call you out on the water just to watch you drown? Why didn't you believe that if I called you, it would be okay? Okay. Did you not have enough faith that when you were forced to step beyond your capability and beyond your comfort to walk in confidence, believing the one who called you would come through? That's faith. That's what faith will constantly force you to do. Faith will constantly put you in positions where you stand at that threshold and you have to cross beyond your capability and your comfort and in confidence, trusting that the one who called you will come through. That's faith. So you want to know if you had it? If you're not frequently, look at me, if you're not frequently finding yourself in positions that are beyond your capability and well beyond your comfort, where you have to have confidence in him or you're going to drown, you're not living by faith. Also, don't get it twisted. See, we love to celebrate Peter. Peter has such faith. And I apologize in advance for how crude I'm going to say this. Sometimes faith is having the courage to throw your leg over the bow and step on the water. And sometimes faith is having the courage to keep your butt in the boat. 
Because sometimes faith is not embarking on some new adventure. It's embracing the circumstances that you don't like in their discomfort. Sometimes it takes just as much faith to stay in the boat. There's another story I could point to there as it does to get out and walk on the water. Because see, everybody ever always heard that saying is a fine line between faithful and foolish. It would have been foolish if that wasn't Jesus calling him out because he would have sunk, sank, sinked. You know what I'm saying? But it's also foolish to stay in the boat if Jesus is calling you out on the water. But to live by faith is to live constantly putting yourself beyond your capability and beyond your comfort and walking in confidence that the one who called you will come through. Today is the 27th, which means two days ago was the 25th. And June 25th may not be meaningful to most of the people in the room, but it's very meaningful to me because it was on Monday, June the 25th, 2007, that we woke up, finished packing up the biggest U-Haul we could find, and Ashley and I finally moved to North Carolina to start Vintage Church. It had been seven years of amazing ministry with people that we dearly loved. My wife taught at a school that she, she really enjoyed. We had friends that had become family, and here we are. God had been stirring in our hearts to go and plant this church, and we had been in the process and making all the decisions, and we bought a house up here, and that morning we got up, and we, we packed up that big old U-Haul. But I'll never forget, we got about 30 minutes from our house in Seneca, South Carolina, and I just turned on I-85 to head north towards North Carolina, and all of a sudden, this overwhelming sense of what have I done hit me. All the fear and anxiety and doubt and questions crashed over my spirit like a tidal wave that felt like it was going to drown me. And literally, I'm thinking, I have just ruined our lives. What am I doing? Why are we doing this? Why have I asked my wife to follow me here? It's me, her, hopefully my parents, and we may have about 10 grand in the bank, and that's it. This thing ain't going to last six months. And I even start thinking, can I just turn around? If I, go, I think they'll take me back. I'll find some way of letting everybody know that this was all just a bad idea. And for several miles, driving down or driving up 85, I kept thinking, this is, I've ruined our lives. That this is not going to work. And in that moment, I, God and I had to wrestle through some things. And you'll never know how close we were to none of us sitting right here right now. And this is what God convinced me of. Matt, you can't. You can't but you should because I'm calling you. And if you'll just go, I will. And those three phrases have been the mantra of my life for the last 14 years. I can't, I know I can't, but I'm sure I should. So I'll be confident he will. I know I can't, I know I'm not capable. I know I'm not worthy. I know I can't. And that breeds a dependence on him that fuels faith your spirit. I know I can't, but I'm sure I should because I hear his voice and I'm walking in step with his spirit. I'm sure I should because it's him calling me and I'll be confident that he will come through because he always has. Faith is so much more than just holding a belief in your mind or a knowledge in your heart. Faith is when belief and behavior intersect. Faith is when you stand in the boat and you know God's saying come out on the water even though you know you aren't capable and you are super uncomfortable you go anyway and if that's constantly not where you are then today you need to do some talking to God so will you stand with me and we're going to worship before we leave here and I want you to have some hard conversations with God I want you to ask that question am I constantly finding myself in positions where I'm incapable and uncomfortable but I'm confident in who he is What's that step that you, maybe God's saying, you've been standing at the bow and I've been trying to tell you to throw your leg over for two years and it's time to go. Or maybe you're standing at the bow and God's saying, sit down. 
because you are where I want you to be and you need to have the faith to trust me and just stay there. Father, I don't know what's happening in the hearts and lives of the people in this room, but I'm so grateful that you do. And Lord, as we worship you now, before we exit this building, before we put our minds and hearts into what happens next week, help us just to take a moment, allow you to cultivate the soil of our soul, to plant the seed that's necessary in it to grow faith in our lives. Have your way, Jesus. Speak to hearts, challenge us all. In your name we pray, amen.